The biggest question that I've been getting lately being who I am in the real estate industry is, is which presidential candidate is going to be the best for real estate? Is it going to be Trump? Is it going to be Harris? Let me know what you think in the comments. But today I want to dive into, you know, the big uh, uh, issues that that each candidate is standing behind when it comes to housing, right? What's that big thing that they're trying to push when it comes to housing? Because housing, let's just face it, has gotten out of control, unaffordable, Okay. Prices are at all-time highs, yet transactions are down to 2008 levels. So the last time that we were out, it's actually down to below 2008 levels. It's down to 95 levels. The reason I say 2008 is because that was the last time. The reason I say 2008 is because 2008 was a catastrophe. Like, that was the... That was the most worrisome time in economic history that I've ever seen in my lifetime. I mean, people were really, really scared. And to be lower than that, but yet prices are still at all time highs. Yes, you've got some pockets of some different areas where prices are lower and prices have settled out, but they're still hovering around. They're holding firm. They're holding firm, even though uh, interest rates are have tripled uh, over the last year to two years, um, and and transactions are down because demand has softened so much because of interest rates and because of prices. And you've got trade up sellers who are literally sitting on how homes they're living in homes they do not like, right? They want to move, they want to upgrade, but they just can't. Because literally their, their mortgage payment will triple if they do that. So they're kind of locked in there. That's really where the definition golden handcuffs comes from. And so we do have an issue in the country. And I think what it really boils down to is affordability and inventory, right? Affordability and inventory. For So who is going to be the best candidate to tackle these issues? That's the question on everybody's minds when it comes to housing. Who's going to dig us out of this hole that we're in, right? And even rent, you know, rent is also at, at all-time highs, right? And it's holding firm. Um, so this is a big issue that's going on right now. And, you know, it's just like, how do we get out of this hole? And my opinion is inventory, inventory. And what's so crazy is, is like builders can't build homes fast enough. Right. And then when we get into these markets, these slump markets, like we're in this year, it's like, they don't want to build. And so like, we're, we're, we're just, we're really in a predicament when it comes to this. Zillow came out and said we're for over 4 million homes short when it comes to the population growth and the amount of families being created, et cetera, et cetera. So we are in this hole when it comes to this situation. So who's going to get us out of this? So I just want to cover what each candidate has said when it comes to housing, right? I want to talk about what election, uh, what, what, what happens the year after election years. Okay. Because I talked about this in the last video that we have an increase in the number of transactions. We've had an increase every after election year going back to 93. So I actually dug deep and went into the data and actually found the actual data around the percentages that we were up, actually the amount of home sales as well that happened the year after election years, going all the way back to 93. I want to share that data with you. And also kind of how I feel about the market moving forward when it comes to what you should be thinking about if you're a real estate agent, because that is you, that that is my audience, real estate agents. All right, so before I get into all that, um, I took some notes here from the Scott Galloway interview that he did with the Diary of, of a CEO incredible podcast. I'll put the link of that that show um, in the description because I you know, the, you know it, I thought it was a great interview. but a couple of things he said about just the overall you know American economy that I thought was very interesting I wanted to share right here was that since 2019 the American economy has grown 12 and a half percent okay He said that's double of any G7 nation. So we've grown double of any G7 nation when it comes to our economy since 2019. That is very significant. Okay, the U.S. stock market was, was one-third of the global market cap in 2009. So you go to 2009, we were one-third of the global market cap, but now we're 50%. So we've grown from a third to 50% percent of the global market cap the usa america all right america he also says america is the largest energy producer in the world um 
Okay, uh, J.P. Morgan is worth more than ten than ten of the biggest banks in Europe combined. Okay, um, and then one thing I thought that was very interesting because he said Mississippi is our poorest state. Okay, our poorest U.S. state is Mississippi. He stated the average household income in Mississippi is greater than U.K. So the average household income, the amount of income that a household makes, right, the average in Mississippi, which is our poorest state, is greater than the U.K. It's greater than Germany. It's greater than Japan. So I saw that to say this. There's 190 countries in the U.S., and he stated that 189 of them would love to trade places with the U.S. Um, and so first off, I just want to make it make a make a statement here that that America is number one and that we are in a, an incredible position. Right. We're just in an incredible position now. Now, bad decisions can reverse that, obviously, but we're in such a great position um, and we're just live in such an amazing country. Right. And, and just I just want to say how grateful I am to be here and to be in a country that gives me the opportunities that has given me. I literally am living the American dream. And thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, for giving me that opportunity because I could have been born anywhere, but I was born in the U.S. Thank you, Jesus, for that. All right. So when we dig into uh, the candidates, what they're saying about the housing market and what they're going to do, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So let's start with Trump. Trump, I made some notes here because I dug into all kinds of data, uh, you know, I listened to all kinds of videos and did all kinds of things. And I made some notes here. And I just want to cover like the main uh, the main things that each candidate is saying when it comes to housing, okay? And it seems like the main thing that Trump is saying when it comes to housing is, is that he wants to open up new tracts of federal land for large-scale housing developments, okay? Um, and so the argument from the other side with that is, is most of the federal land is not really in positions, right? It's not really in the locations where housing is really needed, it's way out in the boonies. It's not near towns, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there is um, a lot of federal land in Nevada, I've found, that, um, you know, that is that is around Las Vegas. Um, and that's a place where home prices have nearly doubled, uh, you know, over the over the recent years. OK. He talks about he's going to um, cut regulations, um, doesn't really talk about which ones that would actually help, you know, housing. Uh, he he strongly supports protecting single family zoning. Okay, uh, he also um, he also he also is kind of against uh, allowing apartment complexes and low income housing in suburban areas. So these are just notes that I took as I'm trying to understand what each candidate is going to do when it comes to the housing market into my industry. Like, what are they going to do to help our industry? OK, one thing that he talks a lot about is the immigration. He talks about um, the illegal immigrants that have come across the border that have come in and, you know, um, occupied housing, which is which is, you know, skyrocketed, you know, rent, you know, home prices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's one thing. So I guess if you tie that in to kind of what he's saying with what he's going to do at the border. Right. Then that could be um, that could tie into housing. Right. And slowing down the amount of people that are coming into the country um, could, in fact, help the housing market in terms of just uh, inventory. Because I said in the beginning, like the number one thing, the number one problem, I believe, is inventory. Of course, it is affordability. It's 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 prices. Right. But but inventory is what helps that we need inventory. Right. We need inventory. OK. When I dug into. Um, you know, there's other things. And like I said, there's a lot of policies that tie back into real estate, in my opinion. Right. When when he talks about inflation and the economy and things like that. Right. That all kind of ties together. OK. When I dug into Harris's plan. For housing, um, you know, her big thing, her real big thing was the twenty five thousand dollar down payment assistance for first time home buyers. Now, when I look at that, like, I, OK. And, and I did not go, uh, you know, I'm, I didn't go to college for economics um, or any of that stuff, but I've been in the industry for, for well over two decades now. And I've seen the ups and downs. I've seen different government 
um, you know, uh, you know, aid when it comes to first time home buyers. We had the eight thousand dollar credit back in two thousand nine, I think. Uh, eight, nine, ten. We had that one. We've had other things that I've been witness to that I've watched firsthand. Is that that my clients actually used to buy their homes, and so I can just tell you that in a low inventory environment like we are in right now, if you introduce a twenty five thousand dollar credit first time home buyers. In my opinion, what I believe would happen is home prices would go up $25,000. That's what I honestly believe would happen because we don't have enough homes. We don't have enough homes. And so if the $25,000 credit is there, right, and then all these first-time home buyers come out the woodworks because they, they got this credit, so they want to go buy a home, well, that increases demand when inventory is still where it is which is really low. We're not even really back to pre-pandemic levels. Like we're getting close, but we're not there. We're not even there yet, pre-pandemic levels. And let me just go on record and say the pre-pandemic levels were, were low to begin with. Pre-pandemic inventory was not where you really want it to be. It was, it was low coming into the pandemic and given, coming into the lower interest rates that happened after the pandemic. And so when you think about introducing, you know, $25,000 credit. Like I, I just strongly believe that we need to figure out the inventory problem first. Like you should introduce that bill into a pool of first time home buyers who need it when there's houses actually available for them to buy. When we're introducing it into an environment where there aren't houses for them to buy, then I think that could be more destructive than it could be productive. Um, you know, like that would literally, it, it would, it would create a, a frenzy of first time home buyers, because let me tell you something. And this is something that I, I don't know if they're actually looking at when they're thinking about this, right. Or, or if these, if the candidates just got to throw things out there to, you know, for, for buzzwords and, and, you know, for interruption, uh, pattern interrupts and, you know, to get our attention and stuff like that, who knows what they'll actually follow through with, you know, politicians are you know, like, they don't really, a lot of them don't follow through what they're saying and follow through a part of it, this, that, or the other is something, is this something that she's actually going to put into action? Because if you look at the birth rates back in 1990, they spiked, they spiked big time, not a little bit, big time, right? 1990 puts people at 34 years old right now. And that spike continued throughout the 90s all the way to 2006, 7. So we've got years and years and years of more th mid 30, mid 30 year olds who are that is your prime first time hot home buyer age. So the medium home buyer is age, first time median home buyer age is 34. It was 33 one year, then it was 34 the next year. Right there in the mid 30s, between 33 and 35 is the median age. For first time home buyers. And we have more uh, 33 to 35 year olds than we've had in decades since the baby boomers. And the baby boomers, we actually had more, right? We actually had more, but then it tapered way down for about 20 years. And now we're right back up a big way. So we've got more right now than we've had in the last two decades. Okay. So the first time home buyers, the people that she's talking about, are like sitting there on the sidelines and there's more of them than we've really experienced. Let's just say in our lifetime, because 20 years ago, you know, and then if you look at where the, the baby boomers and all that stuff, like that was a while back. This is, this is, it's been a while since we've had this much demand of first time home buyers. And we haven't even seen it because interest rates went up just as they were getting into their first time home buying ages. So they're just getting into their first time home buying ages about a year and a half ago, right? As far as the median um, age of first time home buyers, they're really what you know they're really kind of just getting there now. And so, like when interest rates started going up, it kind of suppressed all those first time home buyers that would have came out the woodworks just because of the amount of thirty something year olds that were coming into the picture. So we don't even we don't even understand. We can't even fathom how much. Uh, demand is sitting on the sideline when it comes to first time home buyers. I'm just telling you, we've got more first time home buyer demand than we've, than we, let's just say, it's not that we've ever seen, but it's been a long time and, and our market has no idea what's happening. Okay. So we introduce a bill that gives the, these, you know, 
these first time home buyers, which in my opinion, it's, it's not the record, but it's a lot of them more than we really know. And we're going to, we're going to create a frenzy with these, with these first time home buyers into a very low inventory market. Um, I think that would be kind of a mess in my opinion, but Hey, you know, like if she comes in, right. If she wins the election and, and, and she does do what she says and introduces this bill, like, okay, like home prices go up because there's a frenzy and more transactions happen, you know, okay. Right. Okay. Like I'm a real estate agent. I coach real estate agents and, you know, all my agents will make more money during that time. Okay. I guess. Cause I mean, at that point, what are we looking like on the mortgage payments? I think something, I think a bill focused around mortgage payments would be much more interesting than a bill for, a for, for, for down payment assistance. Right. And if we help them on the mortgage payment, there's probably the argument that, okay, well, that's kind of the same thing because all you're doing is, is brunting, you know, the force of the unaffordability. So it's really kind of the same thing. It's going to make, you know, prices go up because, you know, of, of the mortgage payment and, and so on and so forth. So I, I get the argument, but, you know, it, if you give them 25000 and, you know, home prices go up because there's a frenzy, we're still going to be in the same boat as this unaffordable, you know, from this unaffordable standpoint. Right. Because prices are higher and it kind of defeated the entire purpose. And so what happens is first time home buyers come in, they use that credit and, and and they get a home. Home prices go up because there was a frenzy. But the people who didn't get the credit, they're the ones that are going to get damaged because they, did, they couldn't use the credit. But yet they still have to pay higher prices because of the frenzy that the credit produced. And so I don't I don't see that being being a huge, huge help. Um, but that's our big thing. OK, that's her big thing. Another thing she talks about is ensuring homes go to working and middle class Americans rather than investors. And when I dug pretty deep into this and I tried to figure out how exactly she would do that. Now, there's a lot of different ways she could do that. She can, you know, she could say that, you know, investors, depending on the LLC and the company and et cetera, et cetera, can only own so many you know, investment properties. But there's definitely ways that the government can go in and make sure that the investors don't literally just take over and own every home in America and, and create a monopoly out of rental properties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I didn't see anything. I couldn't find anything on exactly what her plan was to, to actually make that happen. Right. To actually make that happen. Um, let's see what else, what other notes did I have here? What are the notes that I have? Um, she talked about um, expanding tax credits and grants for home construction. So she did talk about something, and I, I you know, about building like 3.5 million homes. I believe that's the number. You can fact check me on that. And my opinion there is, how are you going to do that? And that's another thing I dug really deep on. How are you going to build three and a half million homes? Because the home builders can't even keep up with the construction now. Like they're at maximum capacity. New homes built in 2021. Let's see what it says. Da, 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 da. Let's see. In the U.S. in 2021, 1.5, almost 1.6 million homes were built in 2021. That was a 15% increase from 2020. It doesn't say here that that was the record. Let me see. Okay. According to, uh, I guarantee you that that was a record because that was like the year, like everything was on fire. They were built like crazy. Now it could have been 2005. That was the year there were six, 7 million homes were sold in 2005 and people, and they were building a lot of homes back then. Let's see. Let me go back to that in 2005. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Let's see. Housing starts were two completions, 1.9. And it says that was the third highest annual number. Okay. So when you think about this, like 2 million homes would be, would be a lot for builders to do. And you got 1.5, 1 1.6 1 that was built in 2021. You guys all remember 2021, even if you're kind of new. 2021 was a crazy year. 
you know, she's talking about building more than double what we did in 2021. And like, that was the builders like going as hard as they could to build everything that they could possibly build. I uh, couldn't find a plan necessarily on what, how she was going to make that happen and over what time frame. And are we talking about multifamily, single family? What are we talking about? There's really no details, right? There's really no details on either side of really, when it comes to housing of exactly what the plan is. And that's something I would love to have. I'd love to have a detailed layout. Like, here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to do it. Here's the timeline. Here's the allocation. Here's everything that we're going to do. It's like, why don't we have that, guys? It's like, why don't we have that? Now, when you look at um, years after election years, years after election years. So in 93, we had 3.8 million um, home existing homes sold. That was an increase of 7.9%. Okay, the next election in 96, 97, we had 4.21 million homes, uh, existing home sales. That was an increase by 3.1%. In 2001, the year after the 2000 election, we had 5.25 million existing home sales. That was a record high at the time. That was an increase of 3%. And in 2005, get this, we had the record high in 2001, the year after the election year. And, and the next election in 2004, we had the record high that next year, a new record high of 7 million home sales. That was an increase of 4.2%. Okay, and then 2008, we had an election. We had It was back down to 5 million sales that next year, which was still an increase of 5% from the year before. Okay, in 2013, we had an increase of 9%. That was uh, 5 million homes. In 2017, we had a, a $5.5 .5 million uh, a year. That was an increase of 2%. And in 2021, we had 6.12 million sales. That's the second highest on record from 2000, uh, 2005 was the, was the record at 7 million. It was like 7.1 million. And 2021 was 6.1 million and an 8.5% increase. So 8.5% increase on the last year after the election year. So we're talking about years after the election year. So we're talking about years like next year, 2025. So ever since 93, every single year after election year, we've seen an increase in the number of existing home sales in the U.S. We've seen a positive growth, positive increase. Now, some of these came from down years into good years, like, for example, 2008. Right, 2008 was the election year. That was the down year. And then we came into 2009, which was which was a positive year. Right now, we're down to 1995 numbers when it comes to existing home sales. It's not going to be hard to beat. It's not going to be hard to beat that year. We're definitely expecting positive growth when it comes to the number of existing home sales next year, regardless of who wins the election. Regardless of who wins the election, when it comes to the real estate housing market, we're going to see an increase next year in the number of homes sold, which is a huge huge green flag, like green light, like it's time to go all in right this second, right? Because this is a 90 day lag business. If you want to have a massive 2025, then you want to have, you want to max out January, February, March, April, every single month, 12 months. If you wait till January to start getting to work on your 2025, you're not really going to see the fruits of that labor till March, April. Right, you're literally going to miss January and February from what it could have been. It takes 90 days to really build up momentum, right? 90 hard days of really grinding to build up the momentum. So you you can start in January and get some deals in January, but nothing like you would have if you started right this second. So I urge you because individually we don't have much of a, a you know in on an individual basis we don't have much control over who's going to win the election and, and from what i can tell in the polls who knows if we, i even trust the polls or not but from what i can tell this is a pretty tight election okay pretty tight election could go either way from what i'm seeing now it could be a landslide either way we don't know it's hard to trust the polls what i mean what you know who are they surveying how how many people like it's like what are the polls but at the end of the day we have little control individually. Whoever the president is, I'm going to use this is what Ice Cube's dad told, told him. Ice Cube. Ice Cube's dad told him, son, no matter who the president is, you're going to get up and you're going to go to work every day. So 
no matter who wins the election tomorrow, what are we going to do the next day? We're going to get up and we're going to go to work. And what are we going to do? We're going to go out there and we're going to serve people who are looking to buy and sell properties in our market, either now or in the future. It doesn't matter to us. We're here to help them. We're living on the greatest, the greatest country on the planet by far. Everybody wants to come here. Everybody wants to be in America. But guess what? You're already here. So don't take it for granted, guys. And 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 I would refrain from thinking that if Kamala wins, it's going to be the end of the world. If Trump wins, it's going to be the end of the world. All right. We've already seen both of them in office. Okay. Kamala's been in office for four years. The end of the world didn't happen. D Trump was in office the four years before that. The end of the world did not happen, and it's not going to happen now. We need to continue pressing forward, helping people buy and sell properties, being the best that we can be, developing ourselves, and become the person that people want to do business with before they even talk to us. All right. Hey, get out there and vote. I love you guys. I'm excited to see what happens and what the future holds. I'll see you on the next video.